The subject of uh, tonight is one of the uh, core subjects, um, not only in the Jewish philosophy and Jewish history, um, I may say that it's a core subject in Jewish thought, is the Maimonides or Rambam. Um, I assume many of you know that uh, the Rambam is not only a great uh, um, philosopher, physician, rabbi, but many hospitals around the world and religious institutions and more named after him. I would like to zoom in one of the subjects about the Rambam, which is the Moren Nebuchim, the guide of, of the perplex. Um, obviously, it will not be an um, exaggeration to say that we can have a full year full of lectures just about him and his life and his tremendous influence now, which is about 900 years later. The core study is how one man was able almost like we have very few in the Jewish world that reach that level. Um, they said, uh, there's a famous statement, they said about him, Mi Moshe ad Moshe lo kam ke Moshe. From Moses in the Torah to Moses Maimonides, is no one like that. So his real name is Rav Moshe ben Maimon. His father was a great rabbinic judge. And therefore, in a Hebrew acronym, we um, call it Rambam. Uh, or in those days, in the language, common language there, it was Maimonides. He was born in 1134 and he passed away in uh, 1204. Um, he traveled a lot, not because he wished to, but by force of uh, circumstance, mainly persecution and more of the Jewish people. Um, he was born in very, very short. He was born in the city of Cordova, which is a well-known a, a city in Spain. And then because of the uh, persecution, at that time it was the Islam uh, uh, persecution, later on it was the Christian uh, persecution. But anyway, he moved to, the um, first stage was the, to Morocco, Egypt, and then he was in Israel. Then he was back to Egypt. A few versions, what exactly, how he traveled and what exactly happened. But um, even the subject of uh, his burial site, it's still controversial. There are many people hold that in Tiberias, in Tveria, in Israel, there is a site that visited by many, and they claim that that's the Maimonides um, a grave site, while the Jews in Cairo claim that he is buried there and his uh, burial site is there. So therefore, who am I to say where exactly was buried and what happened? But the first stage of his life was the, um, the um, persecution, not only of the, this tribe, it's called Al-Mohadim, but later on it was the um, growing tension between the Christian and Muslims. Um, just to understand a little more, the, in the Islamic world, it was a concept that's called dimi. Dimi meaning, if you're not going to convert to Islam, we give you another option to live peacefully in our country, as long as you understand that you are a second-class citizen by definition. Meaning, um, dimi, you're not allowed to dress like respected Muslim, you're not allowed to build, um, for example, synagogue, highest than the mosque, etc. So the al muhad by the end of their um, reign, they tried to remove some of those rules of the dimi. But um, he find, the, the Rambam find the life there close to impossible. And he moved with his family to a city called Fez, which is in Morocco. Over there, according to all of our sources, he study uh, medicine. And obviously, again, it's a different study of medicine of the 1100 versus 21st century, but um, after graduation, if I may say in our language, he went, uh, he practiced medicine and he went to Israel. He lived in the old city in Israel. Again, there is a synagogue, one of many named after uh, him. Some claim that that was his synagogue, but the key is he moved from there to Egypt. And to this very day, it's a big question, how come he left the holy city of Jerusalem, the holy state of ancient uh, Israel, and uh, went to Egypt. Um, 
there are many versions. The, the common version is that he felt that he can do outreach and help the fellow Jews better in the diaspora. But anyway, um, that was the era that, um, of the great persecution, mainly from uh, the Christian against the Muslims, but also against Jews. And the common denomination was the idea that uh, they took uh, capture, they took people and they um, find an excuse, a pretext, while what they did something wrong and they put them in jail. So one of the famous stories about him that he was able, when he was in Egypt, because he reached the highest of the highest, which is he was the key uh, medical doctor for the, uh, the dictator, the real, the um, Salah Haddin, the real um, ruler of Egypt at that time, and because of his stature, he was able to raise a large sum of money and release the Jewish prisoners. So um, he built a very uh, good reputation. Again, he had ups and downs in his life. One of them was the idea that financially he was dependent upon his brother David, that was a merchant. But anyway, as we said, um, um, when um, is a great blessings by the end of the Torah, and uh, we are blessed. Like the eagle watching over um, his babies. So that's, they call him Hanesher Agadol, the great eagle, because he reached the level of intellect that, um, as far as the rabbinic world is concerned, it's, um, it's close to impossible. You may argue and you say that Rashi. Um, did something similar, which is the commentary of the entire Torah, Tanakh, Talmud, etc. But uh, as far as the writing extensively over Jewish philosophy and medicine, so many books, the books that we have, they claim that it's more than 80 books the man wrote. Now think, this is way before the printed press, uh, press in Metz, the famous uh, revelation. So it's all handwritten by quill on a parchment all this commentary. So it's a 14 volumes of the Jewish law, Code of Jewish Law that he wrote. Or um, books of uh, philosophy, uh, uh, theology, uh, comparative religion, letters, special letters, um, and more. Uh, in general, he said that uh, any great scholar should not be afraid of constructive criticism. Quite contrary, he encouraged criticism as long as he is not personal. He is in a way was seeking um, kind of um, argument or discussion over subject that people agree to disagree. But he wrote in the introduction to one of the key of his books as follows. What is Judaism? What is Judaism all about? Meaning me, he said, as a rabbi, philosopher, um, a medical uh, doctor, life experiences, prolific author, and more. What Judaism is all about? So he said, Yesod Sodot, the essence, the key point of all Judaism, Ladat et Hashem, to know God. So if um, um, one of his books is a list of commandment, so usually there are rabbis who list the commandment by the chronological order. Some hold that it's a mitzvah of the beginning of the month, the month of Nisan. Some said fruitful and multiple. Everyone has a different view. What is the least of mitzvot? By him to know God. That's the key of the, the beginning of the departure. As we said in Aleinu every time, or uh, we said, Behold rachecha da'ehu. Everything you do, you have to have a feeling, the Rambam said, that the God is there watching you all the time, no matter what. So he said, any person that search his or her life to understand God or to know what is God expecting in the world and what exactly the purpose, um, that's fulfilling a great mitzvah of doing what, what is good in the eye of the Lord. So if you study physics, he said, or you study astronomy or any other subject, and your goal is to understand God better, to understand the attribution of God better, and be connected to God better, you fulfill the most important mitzvah. Again, that's uh, almost like um, some said Aristotelius thinking, some, some said later on Hegel thinking, but that's basically um, um, cleaving or, 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 or delving or uh, connecting the mundane life within the Creator 
and understand that since there is a creator and we are part of his creation and we are delve as one entity and understanding better so, so then we reach the highest several um, great um, scholars try to translate the Raman. the problem is it was written in Arabic so the big translation here and there it's also Hebrew but Arabic Hebrew it's relatively simple the moment you go to other languages something is missing I think the best one is the um, the uh, great Rabbi Kapach. Rabbi Kapach was a short man about uh, four seven four eight height but one of the most prolific prolific of the prolific author he was um, um, a Yemenite rabbi and he basically accurately translated the entire books of the Rambam or at least the books that we know to Hebrew with his own commentary so imagine this is way before the computer era even nowadays um, it was the family called Ibn Tibon that did it but for example since we talk about the first important mitzvah by the Rambam we said in Aleinu Leshabach in our davening each and every time you shall know today what does that mean you shall know what does that mean you shall know now so the Rambam said if you understand why I'm here why I was born to a certain family why I'm in this place what is my goal in life you're asking constantly those questions even you not always have the answer or you don't have the correct answer by merely fact that you're asking and you want to understand God you dedicate time to ask in a way later on one of the great rabbis the Hasidic rabbi of the Breslav he instituted the idea of Hidbonenut which is a person should take time each and every day to talk to God directly in your own language just to communicate um, um, directly now obviously between envious jealousy and other problems uh, you have a lot of opposition you know if you are not doing well everybody likes you the moment you are popular you have a, a lot of opposition so during his lifetime it was close to impossible to fight him but unfortunately after he passed away especially the first 50 years was very challenging for all of his prolific writings because it was um, a lot of um, Middle Ages challenges. People, the highest level, they argue with him. The lowest level, they burn his books. So one of them is the Guide for the Perplex. What is the Guide for the Perplex and why is it so problematic? Let's get the overview. The Rambam codified Jewish law. He basically put something that every Torah scholar use, which is the codification, the explanation for all the commandments, and each command, commandment how and what and where and when. And if, like, he made himself the final authority in that sense, and he became in some area, even many rabbis disagree with a lot of things, but they agreed that his opinion counted, right? So, for example, just give you a, a vignette, a little example. He said in the Yad HaChazakah, the 14 books of uh, Yad is 14. So, he's in a, uh, the mitzvah of davening, of praying three times a day. So, no matter what, you have to daven every day. In the Guide for the Perplex, he went to a totally different direction. On one hand, he said in the introduction, this book is only for the scholars. If you finish reading all my other books, you can study this book. Unfortunately, the, the tendency of people, when you tell them that, they purposely want to study that particular book. So he explained in that book, which is called Ta'amea Mitzvot, in a way he contradicts himself. Because in the previous writing, he said there are many mitzvot like the red heifer, take the ashes and sprinkle it and all these mitzvah. It's not a mitzvah that you should search. You should understand it's the Lord commanded you to do it, the Lord commanded his servant to do a certain thing, do it and don't ask. You know, in the old days in the Cheder, they used to say, Azei Shreiben. That's the way it's written. That, that's the way it's written. That's it. In the Guide for the Perplex, he came out with a lot of explanations of why certain mitzvot commanded. Again, it's his opinion. 
others disagree, but it's his opinion. So, for example, he dealt with the mitzvah of Sha'atnez. The Torah said that you should not mix wool and linen. In one location, he said, it's a law, don't ask. In the Guide for the Perplex, he tried to explain. The idea of sacrificial offering, it's a law. Now he tried to say that it's uh, other nations did all kinds of things. Uh, it was a lot of places that he brings his own interpretation. And the problem with that is, um, the moment you bring your own interpretation, and in Jewish world there are many, you create an atmosphere of, you know, people going to challenge that. So let's take, for example, the, uh, something we read in the Torah just last week, the mitzvah of you should not mix a kid and it, with its mother's milk. Mm -hmm. So obviously it's written three times in the Torah and is a rabbinic writing how to interpret it, the prohibition against cooking, um, um, eating or driving benefit from that, etc. But he basically said there that um, um, the reason it's because of other nations, the, 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 the other nations worship um, this type of idols, and because of that the Torah said, or in other places said it's in, to increase um, fruitful and multiply. So in, 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 in short, he said, search and search and search, and now I'm telling you, I have some explanations for certain mitzvot, and that's the reason, but that cre created a tremendous amount of, of um, uh, objections to, to his writing, to his book. Um, uh, the Torah said, for example, Hashem Elohim Emet, the Almighty is the God of truth. So, what does that mean, truth? He is now the philosopher. He wants to know what does the truth mean. What does that mean when you talk about God or you talk about the Creator? When you use the term Creator. So he starts mocking people in his writing. And he says, people are taking it like cut, chopping wood. That's the creator. He says, no, he says, creator is much deeper. They, it was a great Hasidic Rebbe. I always bring Hasidic stories. So it was Rab Levi Yitzchak from Bardichev. It was a great Hasidic Rebbe. So he used to, um, in those days, the people have a horse and wagon. So he saw a guy that he had a talis and tefillin while he's davening shachris, and he was uh, uh, greasing the, the wheel of his um, uh, wagon. So people came and says, it's inappropriate, it's incongruous, what are you doing? You, you, you should daven, you should focus to God, but what are you? And uh, Rabbi Levi said, no, look at him, even when he involved with work, He's thinking of God, and his mind is always to serve God. So he does that while he's, um, he's using his intellect while he is doing a mundane work. So um, as we said, um, the group of rabbis ob objected his writing, but when it's come to a low, low level, it's always those zealous extremers. So they went in this places like Provence, like Girona, they start burning his books. Now, it's hard for us as a people in the Western culture and Western world to even think that way. Middle Ages happen. So as far as the rabbis is concerned, intellectual, so it was, for example, the great Rabbi Abu Lafia, great, great Sephardic rabbi. He wrote a book called Yad Ramah. So in that book, in the city of Montelier or in Provence, he um, um, objected the whole idea of explanation or explanation to certain commandment or the whole philosophy of the Rambam. And together with another great rabbi, Rabbi Yona, Rabbeinu Yona of Girona, he was the teacher of the Nachmanides and Rashba, another great rabbi, um, he objected publicly to the Rambam and his writing. Another great rabbi that wrote extensively a commentary on the Rambam, whose name is Raived, he wrote unbelievably interlinearly explanation and challenged the Rambam in his writing, but it's all intellectual. It's, it, wasn't, it wasn't a personal animosity. It's just challenging certain ruling or certain explanation or certain philosophical approach and see things in a different way. So in Judaism we said, you and I can agree to disagree and we can be friends. The, ver the problem in Middle Ages when it's go low they did a horrible thing. So, for example, they not only burned the Rambam's books, but they went to the Catholic Church 
and start saying that the Rambam wrote extensively against Christianity and Catholicism. So obviously, um, since they claim for paganism and they claim that, uh, um, which is in part true because the Rambam is no tolerance to all this, he consider the Catholicism as idol worshiping in his writing. So because people inform the, the Catholic Church and the authority, um, which mainly controlled by Christians, um, his writing, they, um, it turned to the extreme, which is, again, traumatized the Jewish world. The people thought that, oh, we're going to them and going to tell them about the Rambam, so it will end up by getting rid of his books. Louis IX, the evil ruler of France, um, he decided to get rid of the whole Talmud, to burn the entire Talmud. So if you go to Paris, you see the, uh, how many of you have a chance to visit the Louvre? The museum in Paris is one of the well-respected museums in Europe, right? Um, so you go to the Louvre, you see a huge, horrible display of how Louis IX commanded to burn the Talmud and how on public stakes they took piles of the Talmud and burned it in public. So obviously this created, um, that was in 1240, um, uh, unbelievable um, desperation. People just left, um, not only those cities, people left uh, Europe or left those um, central places for Jewish faith. And people uh, even forsake the, the Judaism because of that. But as far as the rabbis is concerned, those rabbis took it very deeply and seriously. They claim in their writing, which is fascinating, again, we just give you the abbreviation, that in heaven, in our language, that in heaven they vote for the Rambam. Meaning, it's kind of heavenly tribunal over all these, uh, was discussed over, over all this terrible behavior of, of Jews against Jews. And in heaven they said, well, if you're ready to burn the Rambam's books, then it's all gone. Right? So, um, in one hand, he um, always opposed a theoretical approach to things. He was very practical, meaning everything he wants to know right now, the reason and why you rule in a certain way. Um, on the other hand, um, even his thinking and philosophy, it has to have some sense of practicality. Why I'm doing things in a certain way, why I behave in a certain way. It has to resonate the real, real, real world. Why I'm um, saying that it's because um, one of the rabbis we just mentioned, his name is Rabbeinu Yonah, which is, should be a separate lecture. So Rabbeinu Yonah, at the beginning, he went to all those villages and he talked against the Rambam and his writings. But then the reaction, as we said, the burning of the Talmud and all the the tremendous trauma on the Jewish world caused him to feel a tremendous contrition and remorse. And as a result, he went back to all those places that he preached against the Rambam and his books. And he said, forgive me, I have mistaken. I did something very bad. The Rambam is great. His books are great, etc., etc. And on the top of that, all his life, Rabban Yonah from Girona was so... Um, kind of um, in a state of penitent, he felt so bad about this that he wrote a very monumental book in the Jewish Musa, in the Jewish writings, that is called um, 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 Sha'arei Tshuva, the Gate of Repentance. And I don't remember the exact number, but if I'm not mistaken, 23 chapters, gates, and it was, if I'm not mistaken, it has to be some number, that all those villages that he went through and talked against the Rambam, he counted in his book 23 gates, how a person should reconsider his behavior and do better. And he said, I'm writing it as an act of atonement for my talk against the, the Rambam. So that's a great man like Robin Yonah, which again, we should study him and his writing separately. But, um, the idea that the Rambam uh, was so practical, um, practical um, I, um, I would like to use another example. It was a great um, uh, book that was uh, written by a rabbi named Rav, Rav Israel Iserli. He wrote a book called True Matadeshin. You should know when it's come to Jewish um, writings, 
the code, we have the code of Jewish law, but most of the practical halachot, practical ruling, come from rabbinic responsa. You go to a rabbi, you ask a question, and the rabbi's answer, and then you have it in writing as a responsa. Um, as a student in rabbinic school, the, the, the worst semesters, the whole worst year, was study responsa. And I guess you're not even guess why, why it was so hard for us, because in my course at that time, they brought responses from the Holocaust. So meaning rabbis that wrote responsa while they are in the camp, and people ask them questions, and we need to study those responses. So when you study those responses and you think to yourself, number one, they have no books, and how prolific they are in the answer. Number two, the type of questions that they ask is beyond heartbreaking. Like, like the Nazi camp, just to give you an example. And they said to a guy, um, we want to kill your friend. So the guy said, don't kill him. So they said, all right, you're willing to give us your ear? We will not kill him. So they come and ask the rabbi, you have time for you till tomorrow morning to make up your mind. Is that okay to allow to take off ear from one person in order to save life of another person? Just give you day-by-day -day questions in those responsa. Rabbinic responsa is, again, it's another subject that people need to understand and study because when you are dealing with um, questions people ask you day-by-day, day, it's not always based on the Shulchan Aruch, the Code of Jewish Law. Many times it's based on the responsa. So this great rabbi, um, uh, Iserlin, he wrote this book, this responsa, he called it Trumat Adeshen, and he divided it to each and every day for the Jewish calendar, 354 days. The problem is, he made his own questions. It wasn't a response in a sense that people come and ask him. He made, you see that book like Marvin made a lot of books like that, like uh, you see the Jewish book of why, right? So Rabbi College brought question and answer. So he made up the question and then he have an answer, including myself, it's, it's legitimate, it's fine. But then one of the commentary uh, uh, on the code, his name is Shach, the Siftei Kohen, he challenged that idea. He says, look, when it's come to, to understanding halachot, for example, the Maimonides, have the concept that's called Hashem Imo, the divine providence is there when the teacher asks a question and he has an answer. Here is made up questions. So can we rule and follow just because someone wrote the questions, which is not a practical question that someone asks. Just show you the mindset, it's, it's beautiful. So anyway, one of the writing it's called Igeret Teiman, the letter that he wrote to the Yemenite Jews. At that time, the Yemenite Jews have been very similar to the situation in the Moranos. Later, they have a choice either to convert to Islam or to get killed or, or, or persecuted out of their land. And um, he basically, was the first rabbi that allowed them, again, this is a monotheistic religion, allowed them to kind of pretend that they're accepting Islam upon themselves in order to save their lives. And he wrote extensively a lot of, a lot of encouragement to the Yemenite Jews. So even he was in Egypt, he was so respected that um, for a long period of time, the Yemenite Jews in their Kaddish, they add, their na they add his name. Uh, for example, uh, we said in the Kaddish, Yit Barach, Vit Tabach, Vit Pa'ar, Vit Romam, Vit Naseh. So they add also Rabbeinu Moshe ben Maimon. They add his name within saying Kaddish because he is their savior. He saved them from uh, distinction. Um, now, the problem is, he didn't get the permission from the Supreme Rabbinic Court or from the rabbis to write all these things. And he basically codified the, the law, the Torah and everything else. So people who are zealous, especially when it's come to philosophy and Jewish thought and things like that, they said that, um, you know, it's, it's total heresy, it's prohibited and you should not study it, etc. So the, 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 it's not just the Catholic Church that was informed that this is horrible books and should get rid of. But um, the um, Rambam, before he passed away, when he suffered from all that terrible, not only outer, but inner Jewish world of so much uh, defamation of character and, and more, he wrote one of his letters that says, 
to all of his followers, don't worry, that will pass. It passed eventually because we look today, we are in 2017 and he was, it's not just hospitals and, and schools and yeshivot and synagogues. Uh, my father was a rabbi 52 years of synagogue that was named Rambam um, um, and books, but uh, he was one, if not there, but one of the most respected rabbi ever. So he is the chief codified of, of Jewish law. His nobility is beyond words. His books on medicine, very impressive. Um, take, for example, Thomas Aquinas from the Catholic Church. He even used literature that the Rambam wrote, just as an example. Uh, he passed away, as we said, in the year of 1204. And in many ways, he lived forever in the heart and mind of our people. So um, um, there are so many organizations, there are so many commentary. Take, for example, the commentary on the Talmud, the commentary on the Mishnah. It's, it's unbelievable extensively. Um, um, you may say that Rashi, Rambam, and the Talmud, they're always logical. They have a very critical thinking the way they write. Um, the difference between them and the next generation after the Rambam the next generation after the Rambam is the generation of the Kabbalah, those who deal with esoteric, with the secret part of the Torah, which is also a respected part, but it's a different one. By him, it was very, very much um, um, structural in a logical, almost totally Aristotelian way of thinking. Obviously, his writing has tremendous influence on all of us. Um, his books, studies, forever in so many places and you can spend your entire life and not cover all of his writings which again it's mind-boggling to think how how far in his level of erudition he was able to be a judge be a supreme judge be a, a medical doctor of the ruler be a family man be a rabbi of a community be a prolific author and more how one person can do all of that so obviously, um, there is a lot to learn. One of the important lessons is the idea that when a, um, a person in a position of leadership and you say something that is um, kind of controversial, um, you expect to pay the price. And the Rambam paid a very heavy price, um, especially the end of his life and even after his life, the first hundred years. So. With that said, uh, we'll start now with, with a, some questions. I assume, yes, I assume that some people want to ask. Who wants to be the first one? 